Uh, I'm David Hilborn. I'm Academic Dean at the London School of Theology, and uh, I've been working in theological education for something like 20 years. Uh, before that, I was theological advisor to the Evangelical Alliance UK and a pastor before that. So I come to this topic, I guess, with quite a lot of history when I was an ordinand for the United Reformed Church in the late 1980s. This was bubbling under as a really serious issue for the church. And you'll all know, because you've turned up, no doubt, to learn more, that this has become an ever more divisive and difficult issue for the church. So in that spirit, I want to start with prayer. Let's pray together. Loving God, we're all aware that this topic is about people as well as ideas and doctrines. We know that doctrine affects people, but we are asking your grace for sensitivity and for pastoral concern and care to be in our hearts alongside the need to serve the gospel truly and faithfully. And we pray that you will enable us to do that, both for me as I speak and us as we listen and then talk. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This topic of sexuality and theology is deeply complex. Just in the last two years at this forum, I've given seminars on queer theory and queer theology. And I want to say from the get-go that the focus of this session is somewhat distinct in that most of the serious church debates, the church dividing debates around this topic of sexuality and gender tend still to be focused on same-sex relationships, on homosexuality, Uh, as the term is sometimes used, on gay and lesbian relationships. Although we will, as I did in the last two years, looking at queer theology, consider uh, transgender as well to some degree this afternoon, and gender fluidity and queer theology. But our main focus is on those debates which are problematic for many churches around the world in relation to the uh, LGB side, or the LG side, I guess, of that LGBTQI Uh, spectrum that we're all used to now. And around those debates, typically the theological literature still tends to talk in terms of a dichotomy or a duality between so-called traditionalism, the view that marriage, for example, is between one man and one woman for life, the traditional Christian Orthodox view, the historic evangelical view and so-called liberal or progressive or revisionist understandings which would want to find a theological justification for same-sex sexual relationships and uh, latterly gay marriage as that has rolled out on various statute books certainly in the western world over the last number of years. Uh, Typical of that duality are these two books. uh, The first uh, featuring Dan Vio on the revisionist side and Robert Gagnon on the traditionalist side from 2003, published by Fortress Press, uh, entitled Two Views, Homosexuality and the Bible. And then more recently in 2016 from Zondervan, uh, the uh, series that they run on different views of particularly uh, hot topics in theology, this one edited by Preston Sprinkle called Two Views of Homosexuality, the Bible and the Church. And that featured Uh, two theologians on the traditionalist side, Wesley Hill and Stephen Holmes, and uh, two on what Preston Sprinkle in his introduction calls the non-traditional or revisionist side, um, who were William Loder and Megan de Franza. And so it goes on. This book uh, from 2013, a quite substantive contribution on the revisionist side, published incidentally by Erdman's, more generally associated with sort of evangelical and reformed uh, publishing, also use the language of traditionalism, as you can see from the contents page, and revisionism. And what is uh, the case historically where that duality is concerned is that it's tended to align with evangelicalism on the one hand and other orthodox Christian traditions like Catholicism, to be fair, and Eastern Orthodoxy, um, Uh, orthodox or evangelical understandings, and on the other side, uh, the revisionist side has tended to be 
associated with liberal theology, a theology which takes its cues much more readily from cultural trends, from reason, and from experience in distinction from the supreme authority of scripture, which is affirmed, of course, by this forum. Examples of that duality, a book that was very influential on me as somebody growing up in a mixed denomination, trying to make sense of my theological identity as an evangelical within a broader church where actually liberalism was in the ascendant. Uh, from 1988, John Stott's dialogue with David L. Edwards, an Anglican evangelical Stott dialoguing with Edwards on many topics, including sexual ethics, and very much aligning with that traditionalist revisionist dichotomy with Stott, of course, on the traditionalist side. And you can go to the bookshelf or the bookstore here and buy uh, John Stott's uh, book on this very subject. 10 years later, in 1988, Clark Pinnock uh, had a dialogue with the liberal scholar Delwyn Brown with a very telling title, Theological Crossfire, again, reinforcing the idea that liberalism was aligned with revisionism and evangelicalism with traditionalism. Now, it's interesting that Pinnock uh, is on what Millard Erickson would call the evangelical left, a uh, quite controversial figure around um, the issue of uh, uh, the number of those who can be saved and the relation of Christianity to other faiths and so forth, but still identified with the evangelical constituency. And in that book, they differ, differ quite markedly on uh, sexual ethics. And then more recently, uh, Roger Olson's 2022 book, just from last year, which tracks the heritage and history of liberal theology, still as an evangelical, casting it very robustly as another religious system, a different worldview, not just a variant on Orthodox Christianity as he would see it, but as a significantly distinct tradition. It doesn't discuss sexual ethics really much in that book, but the lines are clearly drawn. And again, the dichotomy, the duality is evident in church debates and votes that have tended to go one way or the other, reinforcing the traditionalist view of marriage as between one man and one woman and uh, sexual activity as being uh, confined to monogamous, faithful, stable, heterosexual marriage for life, the traditionalist view, the evangelical view, and the revisionist view that it is possible to see the value of and even bless and approve uh, same-sex unions. So on the traditionalist side, we have the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches uh, in the UK, the Presbyterian Church of Northern Ireland, in my context, in Britain, United Methodists are just about holding the line on the traditionalist view, although maybe heading for a split in America. Uh, the Free Church of Scotland in Britain and the Free Church of England would be aligned with traditionalism and the Southern Baptist Convention, of course, in America, likewise. But on the other side, the Quakers, the United Reformed Church, where I started off my ministerial career in the UK, Presbyterian Church USA, the Episcopal Church, very uh, famously in the USA, and now the Methodist Church in Great Britain in the last couple of years has adopted uh, an approving policy on gay marriage, as has the Church of Scotland. There may be some allowance of what's called local option for individual congregations on conscience grounds, not buying into the denominational policy, but the denominational policy has been dualized around traditional and revisionist lines. And for the most part, one could look at that left-hand column there of traditionalist denominations and say, yeah, pretty much they're evangelical. And one would look at the revisionist side and say, well, pretty much they're either mixed or liberal denominations, perhaps majority liberal. So those lines of dispute and distinction have been fairly well established over the last 30 years or so. I'm an Anglican, have been since 2002, and my own church, the Church of England, of course, is really now famously struggling, if you've read the headlines, um, in the last few months with this issue, not just in England, but with its ramifications around the Anglican Communion. And on that polarity of traditionalism and revisionism, it looks like the trend is moving from one pole to the other, with the approval by the General Synod uh, earlier this year of the blessing of same-sex relationships. Now, what that means in terms of being uh, formalized in the Summer Synod 
uh, what that means in terms of uh, actually uh, liturgies for gay marriage is moot, but the direction of travel seems to be from traditionalism towards revisionism, towards traditionally a more liberal understanding in that nomenclature. But here's the thing, folks. This is an evangelical forum, a forum that affirms, as I said before, the supreme authority of scripture in relation to reason, experience, and tradition. It's a forum that stands on the gospel, as we heard from Mike Reeves in that plenary the other night, that stands for the uniqueness of Christ, for the authority of God's word in our theologizing. Evangelicals are about the evangel, the gospel, about commending the gospel uh, that the world might believe, about conversion, about the new birth, and about a standing on scripture, which is going to be robust and clear, not least in terms of sexual ethics. But what's happened in the last 10 to 15 years or so is that within the self-identifying evangelical constituency, particularly in the West, there are those who are now saying that it is possible to be an evangelical Christian and affirm the revisionist views that I have been summarizing. So in the same book I mentioned earlier, the Preston Sprinkle book, he notes in his introduction, until recently there was only one view of homosexuality within uh, evangelicalism, the so-called non-affirming or traditional view. Conservatives may protest or disagree, he says, but the fact is that there are a growing number of evangelicals who are either exploring the affirming view of certain same-sex relationships or who have embraced it and aren't looking back. That was back in 2016. As we'll see, that challenge has become more intense for evangelicalism. Now, we can have a lot of definitional debates, and you might want to pick this up in Q&A at the end, about whether taking an affirming view ipso facto disqualifies one from being an authentic evangelical. Some would take that view. But the problem with evangelicalism, and I am a self-affirming evangelical, I've worked for organizations with evangelical in the name happily, signing numerous bases of faith and affirmations of evangelical doctrine. But the issue is that we do not have a magisterium like the Roman church, a central body telling us what the doctrine of evangelicalism across the world is. We have no one global body to determine these things, no congregation for the doctrine of the faith. Uh, equivalent. We are, because of our commitment to our relationship with Scripture, uh, being one in which in conscience we interpret it under the grace of God, and we do so freely in conscience. Uh, because of all of that, we are a multifarious movement. We're a movement, not a church. Uh, we have borders that are sometimes difficult to define. And in the midst of this, we see an increasing number of self-identifying evangelicals who are taking a revisionist view. Now, let me just um, define my terms here. Revisionism in Marxist historiography is uh, a term of abuse, or it's a pejorative term. If you're a revisionist in Marxist understanding, you've betrayed the revolution. You've betrayed the original Marx and what Lenin did with communism. But um, in mainline history, and I teach church history, revisionism is a re-examination of the traditional narrative according to new hypotheses or facts. So it's a fairly neutral word. But in this case, um, the claim of those who are revisionists is to bring new information around the understanding of scripture, uh, new historical understanding, new theories to bear uh, on the uh, issue of LBGTQ+. So on the revisionist side in the States, for example, Tony Campolo, popular, prominent platform speaker. Uh, I knew uh, him through being a Spring Harvest speaker, one of the biggest Christian festivals in Britain for many years. And he was a star of Spring Harvest, uh, lauded by many, a very powerful speaker. Uh, and yet in 2015, in a statement urging the church to be more welcoming to LBGT plus folk, he said this, it's taken countless hours of prayer, study, and conversation, and emotional turmoil to bring me to the place where I am finally ready to call for the full acceptance of Christian gay couples into the church. 
And he talked about the possibility of um, partnered or married uh, gay couples in a sexual relationship being able to reach full spiritual actualization on a par with Christians who were married as male and female. Jen Hatmaker, uh, again, popular author and speaker in American evangelicalism, shifted in 2006 Dean to a view which led her to say this, since gay marriage is now legal in 50 states, that's the Obergefell decision to federalize gay marriage in, in America, since it's legal in 50 states, uh, our um, communities have plenty of gay couples who just like the rest of us need marriage support and parenting help and Christian community. They either are going to find that in the church or they're not, so commending the church's embrace. So, uh, in uh, America, also Megan DeFranza, who wrote in the Preston Sprinkle book, taught at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, and has moved now to an affirming position, according to that uh, Sprinkle book, and her own work, actually, on intersexuality, which is quite nuanced, a separate topic, which I touch on in the Queer Theology uh, seminar from last year, and you can still see that on YouTube, but nonetheless takes an affirming position on... Uh, gay marriage and gay uh, relationships. Uh, we could also point to um, Brandon Robertson, who self-identifies as an evangelical and helps set up an organization called Evangelicals for Marriage Equality, uh, which strives to persuade evangelicals of the propriety of uh, gay marriage. James Brownson's book I mentioned earlier, published by Erdman's, critiques those who have held in the theological space the traditionalist position like Robert Gagnon um, and uh, Thomas E. Schmidt and others. Uh, Matthew Vines, again, writes very much uh, from an evangelical position, describes himself as a conservative Christian with a high view of scripture, yet seeks to show that just such an approach can result in revisionist rather than traditionalist conclusions uh, in that book, God and the Gay Christian. And then there's Mark Axemeyer, uh, who uh, titles his book, uh, the Bible's Yes to Same-Sex Marriage, note the subtitle, An Evangelical's Change of Heart, still claiming the moniker evangelical despite the movement across to an affirmation of gay marriage. We'll return to that a little bit later. Same kind of trends are happening in the UK. Uh, different terms are sometimes used, uh, not just accepting evangelicalism, but including uh, and also uh, uh, affirming, or rather including and accepting as well as affirming. Um, now, when I worked at the Evangelical Alliance back in 1998, uh, I was the, uh, as I say, the staff theologian and helped to draft a major report, the first that the EA had ever published on this subject called Faith, Hope, and Homosexuality. Uh, in that report, we uh, made affirmations, uh, restating the uh, traditional position. And nonetheless, we also noted that even back then, figures like David Atkinson and Michael Vasey, who had taught in evangelical theological colleges and written with evangelical publishers like IVP, were coming across to affirmation of same-sex sexual relationships. And more recently, David Runcorn in my own Church of England, who taught at the Evangelical St. John's College Nottingham, where I was uh, on the staff, uh, also has affirmed uh, gay marriage. And Jane Ozan is a very active campaigner, a charismatic evangelical by background within the Church of England for the acceptance of gay marriage as well, and put together the book in the middle of the bottom row there called Journeys in Grace and Truth, which featured about 15 people in the Church of England from self-identifying evangelical backgrounds or present evangelical understanding in their own mind at least, and uh, that's a sign again of the trends I'm talking about. Vicki Beeching, star of contemporary Christian music in America, again, platform performer at Spring Harvest and many other Christian festivals both in America and in Britain and Europe, uh, came out as lesbian uh, in 2018 and wrote a book uh, called Undivided, her memoirs about that experience. Famously also, you may have heard of Steve Chalk, who heads up a major charity in the UK called Oasis, uh, which uh, does various mission projects, sets up schools and uh, community projects, 
and was, a, again, a major, major figure within British evangelicalism. And in 2013, entered into a uh, tense argument with the Evangelical Alliance, of which he was a, a member and his organization. And uh, that resulted in him leaving because he had changed his position towards a revisionist stance on LBGTQ. Within the Church of England, recently, the Bishop of Oxford, Stephen Croft, who was a principal of an evangelical theological college, Cranmer Hall, Durham, has moved in his own testimony in this book, Together in Love and Faith, uh, as he says, too slowly, in his opinion, from an affirming, uh, rather, uh, from a traditionalist uh, a view, an evangelical view, uh, as would normally be understood, towards an affirming uh, view but still very much somebody who has been steeped in his career within evangelicalism. Now, before we move on to drill down into what this all means for us, I just want to make another important distinction. In 1998, uh, Stan Grenz, the Canadian evangelical theologian, wrote a really helpful book, still think it's very helpful, called Welcoming But Not Affirming. I made a distinction between the hospitality, the grace, the welcome, as he put it, that all churches need to extend to sinners, to people they may perceive to be out with the purposes of God, but nonetheless needing the gospel, the welcome to everybody who struggles with uh, whatever it is that leads them uh, away from God. And he talks very eloquently about the need for the evangelical churches of that period to be more welcoming uh, against the background of unwarranted hostility. Uh, I know that the culture uses the term homophobia even for the gracious affirmation of the Orthodox Christian position on this sometimes, but there is genuine uh, malice and hatred that we can track to certain evangelical movements in the past and statements on this. He was pushing back against that, making a distinction between being welcoming but not affirming. And uh, the affirming evangelical label that became more common in the wake of it, I think, owes something to his distinction. People saying, no, actually, you should be both welcoming and affirming, and denying Grentz's distinction. Wesley Hill, who is on the uh, traditionalist side in the Sprinkle Two Views book, nonetheless talks of the importance of patience and time in the pastoral care of uh, gay and lesbian people in particular. And, and he self-identifies as same-sex attracted but celibate. And he talks about the need for the church to build community and friendship among people who are same-sex attracted, which has not got a sexual component, obviously, but which um, is a deficit that the evangelical churches need still to make up. But he would also say there's a distinction between uh, welcome and affirmation. Now, very controversially, some of you may have picked up online or in the Christian press the case of Andy Stanley, um, somebody whose family heritage is very much conservative evangelical, uh, who uh, last year at a conference uh, for his church uh, in uh, North Point uh, in America, came out and said this, the men and women I know who are gay, their faith and their confidence in God dwarfs mine. And not only is there room for them, there is plenty of room. Now, in the discourse that's followed, his supporters were saying, no, he's being super welcoming. He's stressing welcome. He's not affirming gay marriage. Others are saying, well, is he on a journey towards doing both? And that remains moot. And I'm not going to come down on one side or the other. Sorry? He hasn't clarified. He hasn't clarified. Exactly. And indeed, uh, Al Mola from Southern Baptist Ceremony has accused him of, what is it, studied ambiguity in this matter. Studied ambiguity. And I think that that would describe where quite a few... Um, uh, pastors and leaders and theologians might well be now in the evangelical community as we define that or as they define it for themselves, okay? Now, in the face of all of this, I think that we have to do some work around definitions uh, of evangelicalism. And the term I find most helpful, others have debated me on this, uh, is a term that's used by Oliver Barclay, um, a former a uh, key figure in the uh, Universities and Colleges Christian Fellowship in Britain, and also Gregory Allen Thornbury uh, uh, in America, and Tom Oden uh, 
uh, American theologian, and they all talk of classic evangelicalism. Odin, more generally, of classic Christianity, which he associates with orthodox, creedal, um, uh, patristically rooted uh, Christianity, but extends to evangelicalism. Uh, Thornbury, for him, it's the evangelicalism represented particularly by Carl Henry, the great editor of Christianity Today, um, member of faculty at Fuller Seminary at the beginning, who defined that uh, socially conscious form of evangelicalism, which was distinct from fundamentalism in America after the Second World War. Um, and for Barclay, it is basically the theology of the universities and colleges Christian fellowship and of uh, InterVarsity Press and that sort of center of gravity in Britain and America. More specifically, classic evangelicalism, according to these voices, uh, affirms original biblical apostolic Christianity, to, to, to use a phrase that John Stott uses as a kind of parallel to what evangelicalism is, and what Michael Reeves was talking about, very similar stuff with respect to true evangelicalism the other night, and uh, Christocentric, gospel-focused, obviously, uh, the uniqueness of Christ for salvation with respect to other faiths and the rest, rooted in the Reformation, according to David Bebbington's uh, distinctives of evangelicalism as a historian, uh, biblicist, focused on the cross, focused on conversion, and active in the transformation of the world for the gospel, um, using terms like inerrancy and fallibility to define a high view of scripture, and very much also prepared to work across one's own denominational divides to work with others for the cause of the gospel, Billy Graham being a good example. Having a substitutionary view of the atonement um, and uh, in historic mainline understanding, I would argue, a penal substitutionary view of the atonement. And as I've said, distinct nonetheless from fundamentalism, which tends not to work across uh, denominational divide so much and uh, certainly not with other Christians on social issues like euthanasia, abortion, as evangelicals tend to be prepared to do with Catholics and others. So classic evangelicalism uh, very much, uh, I think, is a, a qualifier that we might be needing to use in this very uh, kind of amorphous space now uh, around what calls itself evangelicalism. The virtue of the word classic uh, is that it is not um, confused, as the word conservative evangelical would be sometimes, with party political allegiance. I don't think uh, anybody in this room would say that we are bound for life to vote for the same party, depending on what that party does with its manifestos. Some may be lifelong Republicans or conservatives or, or, or Labour voters in the UK or whatever, but, um, but ultimately that's not our authority. Our authority is the word of God. and We stand under it and we vote accordingly. Classic means the prime or default member of a class. Uh, Augustine Sandberg, in talking about uh, liter literary classics in the 19th century, spoke of it, uh, a classic being effortlessly contemporaneous with all ages. I love that phrase, effortless contemporaneous with all ages. The gospel is classic in that sense. It's eternal, unchanging, but it's fresh and relevant for every generation. It's a mature representation of something with history behind it. I love that phrase from E.T.S. Eliot, from a lecture he gave during the Second World War, what is a classic? A phenomenon, as he also said, refined over time through history, tested through the ages, but uh, robust, able to be tweaked um, for a particular uh, purpose, um, like uh, the mini car in Britain that's existed since the late 50s and still going, um, like rock albums that can be put on CD or um, that can be streamed on uh, Spotify, whatever, like Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. We use the word classic in a, a loose way, but in this sense, it's about that effortless contemporaneousness with all ages. It's about the mature representation of something with history behind it, and it's about the gospel for us as evangelicals. So there are really helpful resources that have been published over the last, what, 20, 25 years from the classically evangelical position on this subject that I commend to you. Uh, books that are on the bibliography on your handout. I've been very deliberately quite voluminous in, in, in providing you with, with sources on this, both revisionist and traditionist, if you really want to go in your reading deep. Uh, Thomas Schmidt's uh, Straight and Narrow, 
from the mid-90s, Robert Gagnon's landmark book, a really tremendous piece of work, uh, The Bible and Homosexual Practice, an excellent study of the comparison often made by uh, revisionists between slavery and uh, the liberation of women and homosexuality, his book Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals, uh, uh, there. And uh, Jonathan Grant's more recent uh, cultural studies approach to the whole phenomenon, Divine Sex, is very, very good. An Apollos book um, from the uh, 2007 period uh, by Thomas Noble, Sarah Whittle, and Philip Johnson as editors called Marriage, Family, and Relationships. A great kind of um, dissection of the sexual revolution by Glyn Harrison, uh, psychoanal uh, psych um, uh, a psychiatrist, uh, evangelical psychiatrist, a better story. And then David Bennett's very moving testimony to his own journey from uh, uh, active promiscuous uh, homosexual lifestyle into a celibate Christian one, A War of Loves. And Ed Shaw, same-sex attracted celibate, writing about his theology and experience uh, in the British context. All very helpful resources along with the others I put under the uh, traditionalist moniker in the bibliography. Again, uh, I continue to chair the Theological Advisory Group of the Evangelical Alliance. I don't work there, but I, we have a Theological Advisory Group that I chair. And over the years, we've put out various statements on this matter, which reaffirm that classic evangelical view. So in the report, Faith, Hope, and Homosexuality, and also later, a report called Biblical and Pastoral Responses to Homosexuality, we talk of marriage between one man and one woman, an exclusive relationship for life, and um, homoerotic sexual practice incompatible with God's will as revealed in scripture. And then chastity outside marriage for those who either have not yet got married or have committed themselves intentionally to singleness. Two uh, reports on trans, so transsexuality, as it would have been called 20 odd years ago in 2000, um, God creates human beings as either male or female, and a transsexual lifestyle is incompatible with God's will reveal in scripture, and then transformed from 2018, talking of gender dysphoria and the sympathy and the pastoral care we need to have for folk who feel that they've been born in the wrong body, but nonetheless saying that we resist and oppose forms of transgender ideology. And this is not a seminar in which I'm going to delve deeply into the um, biblical texts, which are very familiar in the debate and have been for 30, 35 years um, in great, great detail. But uh, you'll be aware, I'm sure, those of you who take an interest in this subject, of the key texts being the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2, God creating uh, humans, male and female, in his own image. Um, the story of Lot and the men of Sodom who want to sleep with visitors who they perceive to be male but are actually angels, and the judgment raining down on Sodom and Gomorrah as a result. Um, the condemnation in Leviticus 18 and 20 of men having sex with men. Some reference to transvestism in Deuteronomy 22.5 being unacceptable, and in Deuteronomy 23.1 to uh, those emasculated or cut eunuchs not being able to enter the temple, which interestingly is abrogated by Jesus in Matthew 19 when he talks about eunuchs for the kingdom and eunuchs being acceptable under the new covenant and fully included. Matthew 19 is also more generally, of course, a, a rousing reaffirmation of the marriage bond. Uh, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. In Matthew 22, in a debate uh, with the Sadducees about uh, marriage and the resurrection, he says some interesting things uh, about marriage, which we'll return to, but in the context of reaffirming it, Romans 1, 26 and 7, pretty much the only uh, text in scripture that overtly condemns both same-sex sexual practice between men and women. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10 use the same Greek word and its, and its variants uh, for um, what is generally regarded to be same-sex sexual practice between men. Now, around these texts, there is an attempt by biblical scholars in the more revisionist tradition to reinterpret them in favor of same-sex relationships. That is something that is done by Brownson, by Matthew Vines, and by others that we'll investigate shortly. 
But I want to suggest that that's just one of the forms of revisionism now that we have to contend with. And here's, the, if you like, the really, I hope, original takeaway for you from this session, which is that I believe that there are multiple forms of revisionism. And to hold our integrity as classic evangelicals, we need to be conscious that we need a nimble and uh, sophisticated hermeneutic which will be able to dialogue on all these different fronts. I'm not too fond, usually, of talking about this debate uh, in military terms, in martial terms, but one way to look at it would be that there are challenges on multiple fronts, like sometimes happens in a military context. And you have to be able to see what's coming from different angles. And so in my uh, taxonomy that I've shared in a paper for the Evangelical Alliance recently, I want to suggest there are six forms of revisionism. Now that may blow your mind. You might think, oh my goodness, how am I going to cope with this? But it is really important to uh, have this subtlety and this diversity of arguments in mind so that you can stand on the gospel. 2 Corinthians 10.5 talks about taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And my suggestion to you is that there is more than one thought to grapple with in revisionist, not least revisionist evangelical understanding of this issue. So it's going to be challenging, but uh, we're going to, um, for the last part of the talk, I'm going to take you through these different modes of revisionism and how evangelicals have and can respond from the classical view. So exegetical revisionism. Uh, this is a view represented by people like Bill Countryman in his book, Dirt, Greed, and Sex, uh, by um, various people like Adrian Thatcher, James Brownson himself, Matthew Vines, Robert Song, Andrew Davidson, and Megan DeFranza. It argues on the revisionist side that contested biblical texts don't mean what they've traditionally been taken to mean. So these are people who are working with a historico-grammatical approach to biblical interpretation, who have a, a focus on the biblical text um, and want to suggest that biblical texts which have traditionally been understood to prohibit same-sex relationships in particular, can in some cases be seen as affirming them. Classic evangelicals will typically argue that a sufficient number of contested biblical texts prohibiting homoerotic relations and transgender identities do actually bear universal and timeless application. So one of the moves made by revisionist exegetes like Brownson, like Countryman, like Loder, that I mentioned earlier, is to suggest that there is a historic context to some of the prohibitions which limits the type of relationships that are at play in the ancient world. So um, let's begin with Genesis 1 and 2. Now, typically, classic evangelicals like Robert Gagnon, like Thomas E. Schmidt, Stan Grentz, Richard E. Hayes, and William Webb and others, would look to the narrative of creation in Genesis 1, 27 and 8, and then particularly uh, Genesis 2, 18 to 24, and stress the creation of humanity as male and female in the image of God as distinct and complementary rather than two of the same. It's the basic context for human sexuality, procreation, and marriage. Yes, there are instances of polygamy and concubinage later in the Old Testament, but classic evangelicals see an overarching biblical trajectory of redemption and liberation towards heterosexual monogamy, which is, of course, then reaffirmed by Jesus in Matthew 19. Now, for revisionists like Michael Vasey, James Brownson, Victor Paul Furnish, and others, that argument represents what they call a naturalistic fallacy, a leap of logic, as Vasey puts it, from what is to what ought to be, a flawed inference of exclusive divine intentions from particular biological consequences. So they, they argue that so firm a causal link between binarity and procreation ignores the point that most heterosexual activity is non-reproductive, that many heterosexual couples can't have children, that plenty of heterosexuals who remain single never have children, while some never have sex at all. In response, classic evangelicals concede, typically, that heterosexual sex isn't always defined 
uh, by that gives the graphic language penile vaginal penetration and the reproduction that can follow from it. They also acknowledge the importance of singleness and abstinence in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 7, for example, if not so much in the Old. Yet they do characteristically maintain that the connection between heterosexual activity and procreation is not incidental. It's part of God's creation order. Indeed, they stress that it's presented as a foundational command, the command to be fruitful and multiply, that's then replicated in numerous covenants that God sets up with Israel later in Genesis 9, 15, and Genesis 18, and also 1 Samuel 7. So there is this trajectory towards the redemptive relationship, the definitive redemptive relationship being monogamous heterosexual marriage. And as I've said, that's reaffirmed by Jesus, not only his attendance at the wedding of Cana, which we see in that picture, but also, of course, as I've said, in his uh, reaffirmation of marriage on that model in Matthew 19, 3 through 12. Interestingly, also, in verse 12 of Matthew 19, there is, as I say, a greater openness to eunuchs who would have been ostracized from the core community of Israel. Um, and some, like Martin Nissenen, and the Franza hints at this as well, see somewhere in the three types of eunuch that Jesus talks about there in that verse, um, maybe an opening to the idea that eunuch means gay in that context. But the evidence for that is thin, to say the least. In fact, it's dismissed as such by, um, by Gagnon and also uh, by a number of others as having no, uh, no warrant from the rabbinical literature on eunuchs. Now, also around Matthew 22, Jesus has an extended abstruse debate, you remember, with the Sadducees about Leverite marriage and you know, multiple marriages and who will be whose partner in heaven if somebody is married multiply in that system. And he says, uh, they neither marry nor are given in marriage in heaven, but will be like the angels. Uh, Robert Song takes the mystery of that, and let's face it, who in this room will know exactly what that means? I certainly don't, and I've studied that text extensively. But he takes the, the idea of a transcendent humanity, a transcendent form of human relating uh, uh, in the resurrection life, and yields it back from the eschaton and puts it here to say, well, marriage is provisional. The traditional definition of marriage is subject to change. And we often live now as if the future is here. The kingdom of God is among you, said Jesus. And Robert Song, Durham theologian, argues, ah, here's a warrant for an alternative vision of marriage, which is actually an anticipation of the new heaven, new earth. And maybe we can relate that to gay partnerships, a kind of third form of, 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 of living humanly in relationship uh, between marriage, heterosexual marriage, and chaste singleness. Now, Andrew Goddard and Ian Paul on the classic evangelical side have argued both that's a, a massive speculation, but also uh, it is not warranted to bring speculative notions of what life in the new heaven and new earth might be for husbands and wives back into the present. That's Jesus very deliberately um, saying to the Sadducees, look, you are trying to pin me down and catch me out, and this is something that will be known in the heart of the Father now and will only be revealed then. So it's an unwarranted speculation. And then just one more example of exegetical revisionism, uh, among many that I could cite, uh, is the example of Romans 1 that I mentioned earlier. Now here, for classic evangelicals, the Genesis creation ordinance stands squarely in the background, and that does seem to be the context around which Paul talks three times of same-sex relationships being parafusin against nature, or natural relations being exchanged for unnatural and being akin thereby to idolatry. For revisionists like Victor Furnish, Michael Vasey, Matthew Vines, and Keith Sharp, that understanding of what nature and natural means is to be relativized to what natural was understood to be 
in that Greco-Roman world. So they want to confine generally the uh, relationships that Paul is talking about there to forms of exploitative or unequal same-sex relation. An older man temporarily mentoring and perhaps sleeping with a younger boy. Um, cult prostitution or temple prostitution. Uh, or perhaps forms of uh, short-term liaison in the military, which Martin Nissen and, and others have talked about. Uh, another scholar called Karagounis has talked about that kind of uh, relationship in the military in the Greco-Roman world. But for classic evangelicals, the universal and the creational sweep of Paul's argument in Romans 1 can't be gainsaid. It is, he has in mind something that is put in place from the beginning for all time. And uh, they argue uh, against the relativizing of models of same-sex relations in that sense. Now, that's a quite a familiar set of debates. I'm sure that many of you in this room have read those exegetical debates. Um, and one thing I'd say about those is revisionists are at least working with the text of Scripture. That's their starting point. They may end up in a very different place, but they are starting there. Um, and therefore, the, the, the ground, the topic is at least the material that we're working with similar to those of classic evangelicals. The same is sort of true of the second type of revisionism, which is thematic revisionism. Here, biblical macro trajectories of love, justice, compassion, equality, fidelity, and so on, trump micro exegesis of what some call the clobber texts, the texts I've just mentioned. You know, yanked out of context, they're used to put down gay and lesbian people, so the revisionist argument goes. And we need to look at the big picture, we need to raise our sights to liberty, justice, and freedom those sorts of concepts. And they're the important narratives in Scripture. For classic evangelicals, the argument tends to be such macro trajectories are misconstrued if they're taken to exonerate practices that Scripture more specifically condemns as sinful. So let's get into this. For the Anglican scholar Geoffrey John, there is a focus on what he calls permanence, faithfulness, stability as criteria for all human relationships that matter. And he takes those generic qualities and he applies them to same-sex partnerships. He himself is gay. And he argues that that's the key thing, not the particular um, sex of those involved. So he's not for promiscuity. He's not for sexual license. He's for gay marriage, being faithful, stable, monogamous, permanent. In the case of uh, Coretta Scott King and Desmond Tutu, Coretta Scott King, the widow of Martin Luther King, uh, they make analogies with racism. So they talk about justice uh, being something that's had to dawn more gradually in the evangelical churches uh, as a, an important matter. And they make comparisons between uh, racial segregation in the United States in the 50s and 60s, and in Tutu's case, apartheid. And they say uh, it took evangelicals, many of them, time to wake up to those issues of justice. The same will happen here. Justice will trump the microexegesis of particularly prohibitive texts because it's ultimately more important. But on the classic evangelical side, William Webb, in, again, a book I would strongly commend to you, Slaves, Women, and Homosexuals, argues that actually, whereas with uh, women, because that's another example that's often cited, Tutu talks about misogyny and patriarchy and that having to be overturned. Um, with women and uh, slavery, which is another example which tags into racism, of course, um, there's a biblical movement towards liberation, women in Jesus's apostolic band, women participating, Priscilla and Aquila schooling Apollos, uh, women having status, whatever one gets into with complementarianism and egalitarianism, there is a trajectory towards the recognition of women being part of the ministry of Christ and the church. There is also clearly a uh, uh, condemnation of slave trading in 1 Timothy 1, which Wilberforce picks up on and the abolitionists in the 19th century. But with 
the issue of same-sex relationship, there is no such movement, Sartre says Webb. But all the mentions of it are uniformly negative. And so he talks about there being no significant dissonance on that topic within the biblical data. Third model. We're moving in the third model, what I call canonical revisionism, away from, away from working on the same sort of ground. So in the case here of people like Dan Vio and Walter Wink, Dermot McCulloch and Luke Timothy Johnson, there's an admission, ironically, that the biblical texts that we've been talking about do mean what they've traditionally been taken to mean. They are prohibitive, they would say, homophobic. And yet those texts can be bracketed off as culturally captured to outmode moded mores, outmoded ways of moral thinking. So clearly there's no attempt here to buy into evangelical ideas of plenary inspiration of scripture, uh, scriptural supremacy. This is a canon within the canon approach that they're taking. And they are choosing to accentuate those biblical narratives which are coincident with cultural understandings today of liberation, justice, and freedom. But their rejoinder to us as classic evangelicals is, well, we have our canon within a canon. So it is a genuinely relativistic kind of argument. Uh, we've ignored social justice texts. We haven't taken the liberation stuff in Luke 4, the Man Nazareth Manifesto, seriously. We've been too individualistic, too focused on pietistic understandings of conversion. We haven't taken that justice agenda seriously. So we are, we are guilty of the same thing. We're all doing it, so what's the difference? Okay. It's a somewhat cynical view, but the classic evangelical response uh, from people like Robert Gagnon, uh, Thomas E. Schmidt, Webb himself, and Ian Paul, uh, a scholar I worked with at St. John's Nottingham for a while, is that unless they're specifically abrogated by later biblical texts, we've got no right as Christians to decommission culturally incongruent verses or passages. Uh, if in this room you've signed up to statements affirming infallibility, inerrancy of scripture, supreme authority of scripture, that won't be a surprise to you. Scripture must be consistent in interpreting itself. If Jesus lays aside a proscription from the law of Moses, that's one thing, as he seems to do in Matthew 19 around the uh, alienation of eunuchs from the temple. But unless that specific overturning of a previous prescription is evident, then uh, we take seriously, of course, Paul's invocation to uh, Timothy that all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed. So the sort of insouciance towards uh, plenary inspiration is evident, for example, in this quote from Walter Wink, where he says, where the Bible mentions homosexual behavior at all, it clearly condemns it. I freely grant that. The issue is more precisely whether that biblical judgment is correct. So putting scripture at the bar of human reason, of human interpretation unashamedly from a sort of more liberal and radical perspective. Luke Timothy Johnson, even more starkly, I have little patience with efforts to make scripture say something other than what it says through appeals to linguistic or cultural subtleties. So he's, he's, he's slamming exegetical revisionists like Bill Countryman and others in that sense. But look at what he goes on to say. I think it's important to state clearly that we do in fact reject the straightforward commands of scripture and appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. We can discuss what that other authority is, but you can probably guess. Mark Actemeyer uh, is a leading voice in the fourth mode of revisionism, what I call therapeutic revisionism. Um, therapeutic revisionism is a, an approach which argues that overarching imperatives in the scriptures of healing and wholeness and human flourishing have to take precedence when LGBTQ people suffer because of the traditional view of the church on their identity and relationships. The classic evangelical response to that well-being oriented approach, if it's in isolation from everything else, is that it falls foul of what in moral reasoning is called a consequentialist ethic. So one that will argue from therapeutic ends often construed from a, a kind of humanistic perspective uh, towards divine intentions, where divine intentions for our well-being may not align with more secular 
more progressive, more liberal understandings of what well-being and human flourishing is. And more technically, in the whole debate about this, there is an understanding that um, the consequentialist approach construed in that revisionist way begins to create all sorts of problems for the providence and the authority of God in determining what is the good for human life. Actemeyer, in that book I mentioned earlier, The Bible's Yes to Same-Sex Marriage, an evangelical's change of heart, tells the story of a student of his at Dubuque Seminary, where he taught, Presbyterian as he was, uh, called uh, Kirsty. I can't remember whether it's an anonymized name or not, probably. But this is a, a, a girl brought up in a Christian home, a woman, young woman brought up in a Christian home, a uh, conservative Christian home, who uh, manifests as same-sex attracted and begins to struggle to the point of suicidality with her same-sex attractiveness. And Actemeyer in the book goes to Psalm 1, particularly talking of uh, well-being and uh, human flourishing for those who are faithful to God. And he argues that Kirsty is faithful to God. Uh, the fruitfulness and delight promised in that psalm to those who follow God's law should be accruing to her because she has tried really strenuously to be obedient and to be chaste and to be abstinent. And yet, from his perspective, it's making her ill. It might even possibly kill her. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the genuine struggles that same-sex attracted people have in that space, in that context. It's really, really important to take them seriously. But as a mode of moral reasoning, that consequentialist approach does suffer when there are narratives, if you like, on the other side, which speak of tremendous struggle and hurt and pain as well. Whose hurt and whose pain is to be taken more seriously. The one of the person who maintains a chaste single life or the one who, for the alleviation of the pain, um, embraces a same-sex lifestyle. Actemeyer goes on to affirm Kirst is joining the LBGTQ group at um, a, a, a local uh, university and he sees her living a much healthier life uh, at the end of it. Now, again, this is a very, very sensitive area, but it is important to say that there are narratives of great struggle and pain among those who have um, come from an active same-sex lifestyle like Rosaria Butterfield and Jackie Hill Perry, whose struggle has been in their narrative to obey the commands of God and to move away from that lifestyle, either into uh, singleness, or in Butterfield's case, into um, a, a heterosexual marriage. So Butterfield talks of that journey that she took from being a gender studies professor, an archetypal radical on these issues, to this. She writes, I really believe in Charles Bridges' words, the very chains of Christ are glorious. Peter, after being beaten for preaching the gospel, rejoiced that he was counted worthy to suffer shame for Christ's name. I pondered this. To the world, this is masochism. To the Christian, this is freedom. So taking the external signs of struggle and pain and uh, even illness alone as your moral logic can be problematic because in a sense, uh, both, both streams in this debate have their narratives of suffering and pain. And there has to be another overarching authority, which is the word of God, which is God's best for humanity. And T.N. Nelson criticizes consequentialism for presuming to understand what the ends of God's purposes are around human flourishing. The only reliable source to understand what they are is scripture. The last two um, <clears throat> forms of revisionism are a little bit more straightforward to deal with. Illuministic revisionism is uh, represented, I think, uh, quite often in Vicky Beeching's uh, memoir, Undivided, but also is very prominent in Jane Ozan's. Now, Ozan particularly would not claim to be 
a theologian, an academic theologian, and that's fine. She's not writing a book of theology. She's very clear about that. Beeching is also clear that while she has studied theology, she uh, is writing a memoir rather than a, a dense theological text. But she does talk in her, um, ex uh, in her testimony, if you like, uh, of uh, an engagement with Acts chapter 10, Peter's being told, you know, arise Peter, kill and eat on the roof there in Joppa um, as uh, Cornelius has summoned him. And he realizes that there's a greater liberality around food laws than there was under the old covenant. So in Illuministic revisionism, God can speak directly to or otherwise directly convince people who might be LGBTQ plus uh, to embrace an LGBTQ lifestyle through a vision, through a word, um, unmediated directly to them. Uh, and in the classic evangelical response, of course, present day prophecies, visions, pictures, dreams, epiphanies, theophanies must be tested against the eternal authority of scripture. So for Beeching, reading that account of Peter, which is about food laws, she makes an extrapolation to an affirmation of her own lesbian identity and of her being able to enter into a sexually active lesbian relationship, at least potentially. So she talks of uh, engaging with the text and then notice uh, she says, um, God accepted me and loved me and my orientation was part of his grand design. There was nothing unclean about it and nothing to run away from. Now that's her account of an experience that's very real to her, but in exegetical terms, does it square up with the text? Is there anything in the text that affirms same-sex relationships? No, you'll know that there isn't. In fact, spool forward to the Counts of Jerusalem in Acts 15 and Pornea, which is, which is um, condemned by Jesus, sexual immorality is likewise condemned at the Council of Jerusalem, which is convened in the wake of Peter's uh, illumination. So Jane Ozan comes from a charismatic evangelical background. She's well, well used to having words from the Lord and to uh, being delivered sometimes, and perhaps problematically in her own narrative, by people who think that she can be exorcised of the demon uh, of lesbianism. And there is, there is a narrative of abuse around that, and we have to take that very seriously. But fundamentally, it's interesting here that she speaks of, of that experience, then moving towards having to have a homophobic spirit, a repressed sort of homophobia expelled from her so that she can live a flourishing lesbian lifestyle. So you see the problems from a classic evangelical point of view with that experientialist or illuminist view. And then sixthly and finally, and this is where I love your, uh, love your input, the intradenominational revisionism particularly that's present in broad churches which have evangelicals in them, but which may also be uh, mixed around uh, liberals and, and, and others, like the Church of England. So here the argument is that for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ, we must hold on to the unity of our denomination. From a classic evangelical response, that reasoning presumes that matters of sex, gender, and marriage are secondary by comparison with imperatives of ecclesial unity. Yet Jesus, as we've said, took marriage to be at least as crucial to Christian community and society. Besides, the unity of a particular denomination isn't the same as the unity of Christ's body or the church as a whole, what the creeds call the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. To presume that your particular denomination, which will be one of tens of thousands around the world, uh, accords with that is problematic. Marcus Green, in this book, The Possibility of Difference, talks, uh, quoting Justin Welby, of an analogy between trying to keep the Church of England together and the division that we see in the wider world around conflicts in Ukraine, historically in Northern Ireland, um, in Sudan, and so forth and talks of the Church of England needing to model staying together as a witness to Christians' commitment to oneness and unity. The Global Anglican Future Conference, however, that met last month in Kigali, which has a slew of global Anglicans gathered with great concern about the movement of the Church of England, 
and the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury as the first among equals in the Anglican Communion has pushed back on that and said we cannot walk together in good disagreement with those who have deliberately chosen to walk away from the faith once delivered to the saints, Jude 3. Schism is in the air because for those guys and women who would identify very much with the classical evangelical position I've been outlining, this is a matter of conscience which has become a first order matter around the authority of scripture and the providence of God. So folks, that's quite a lot to take in, but I think it's important to nuance this whole business of what revisionism actually means and what we're dealing with as evangelicals or classic evangelicals today. 